It's uh, my privilege to introduce our speaker this morning, Pastor Eric Irwin. Eric is the senior pastor at Covenant Presbyterian Church in Issaquah, Washington, where he has served since 1996. Eric received his BA from the University of California at Berkeley and his Master's of Divinity from Covenant Theological Seminary in St. Louis. He and his wife, Lisa, have three children, Hannah and Luke, who are both Covenant grads, and Abby, who is currently a sophomore. Uh, Eric loves mountain biking the peaks of northern Washington, and I am confident that God, in his abounding mercy, can even overlook the fact that he is a Seattle Seahawks fan. We are blessed to have him with us today. Please extend a warm Scots welcome for Eric Irwin. Uh, we, we love this place. Uh, it's an honor to be here and uh, humbling to I want to speak to us from Ephesians 3, 14 down through the end of the chapter. Uh, for all of his intellect, Paul has a simple and a beautiful love for God. Most of chapter 3 is uh, an equally simple expression of desire that others would know and love God in the way that Paul does, especially the Gentiles. That's the real burden of his heart in that passage. Uh, and here... At the end of chapter 3, this is his most passionate expression of that desire. It's a beautiful section in Ephesians, but the language is very elevated. I think often you're tempted to sort of skim it because there are phrases here and you don't know exactly what they mean. So uh, we'll just take a moment and soak on this text. Here it is, Ephesians 3, starting at verse 14. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. I'd like to begin with a question. Here it is. You think it's possible to be indwelt by the Holy Spirit in all his power <clears throat> and not know it. So try to imagine it. The third person of the Trinity lives inside you and you don't know it. Is that even possible? Is that, is that imaginable? I think often we're not entirely clear on what it is that drives us. What's the source of your passion? what motivates you or compels you. Uh, church people, we tend to have a really clear idea of what should compel us, and I think sometimes we think, well, if it should compel me, that is what motivates me, what compels me, but I think that's, of course, not the same as knowing what actually does compel us, what actually drives us. So that's a question just to hold in the back of your mind. Uh, in literary terms, I think this passage is the climax of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. I think it's the heart and soul of this letter. Let me give you four reasons. It's the most heightened or transcendent language that Paul uses in this letter. Uh, secondly, it expresses his deepest longing for the Ephesians. This is the one thing for which he says he gets down on his knees before the Father. When he's finished, he breaks into doxology. I think that's significant. And then finally, the book pivots on this point. If you know Paul, he does doctrine, then ethics, doctrine, ethics. That's the structure of his letters. And this is the turning point in Ephesians where he shifts from doctrine to ethics. So that's the climactic moment, but I also think it's enigmatic or somewhat confusing or mysterious. Uh, for one thing, at the center of this text is Paul's prayer that we would know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. How can you 
know anything that surpasses knowledge. What exactly does that mean? But I think almost every petition in this prayer is difficult to understand. What is it to be filled with all the fullness of God? How do the riches of his glory strengthen us? Uh, What is it to be strong in my inner being? Or what's my inner being? How do I know if my inner being is weak or strong? So again, I think Sometimes when a text is nebulous, we skip it. There are some things here that are very clear. Whatever these things are exactly, Paul considers them the result of prayer. How does this stuff happen? Well, you get on your knees and you ask God for it, and he begins to transform you, and that's the power and work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, And without doubt, the centerpiece of the entire text is knowing, being rooted and grounded and being filled with the love of Christ. I'll say this, and then I'll tell us a story. I think Paul is trying, or he's praying, that the Ephesians would be recast in the core of their identity, that God would change them in the core of what moves them and drives them. And he assumes that in the core of your being, there's this kind of nexus. It's almost like a nerve cluster that is the seat of who you really are. And if God answers this prayer, the Ephesians will be reshaped in their innermost selves. And if that happens, if that happens to you, it changes everything. It changes what you love, changes how you think, changes what you do and what you say. If that innermost self is transformed and maybe God then takes you and changes the world around you. So hold that thought for a second. Uh, When I was in college, I was a young Christian. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. And uh, I was a person very much moved by longings and passions and often by fears that I didn't really understand for probably a couple decades after I got out of school. If you asked me why I did something or why I held some particular view, I could give you a rational explanation for that. But that was sort of like a smokescreen, right? We all figure out how to give acceptable versus unacceptable answers for why we do what we do, especially around, I don't know, people like parents and others that we feel are demanding rational explanations. Um, But in reality, I was really driven by impulses and passions, and those worked very powerfully on me. I didn't get into ministry until my 30s, I think because of obvious lack of maturity on my part, and Early on, I ministered to people in college at Washington University in St. Louis. I went to Covenant Seminary. I had a couple ministry jobs, and one of them was to students at Washington University. It's a really tough, competitive, academic setting. And I remember being in a conversation with a student. This guy couldn't have been more different than than me. And, And he was telling me about just breaking off a relationship. And he said something like this. I love to be with her. I really care about her. I think we could be married and uh, get along beautifully. But I've been looking at my course load and considering the timeline of my career track, and I just don't think a relationship is a sound idea right now. I felt like I was talking to my insurance agent, you know, some guy who was all about risk management or like your dad's financial planner. Everything he said was just so measured, and it was so sensible, and I kept pretending that I was the mature one in that conversation, but I could feel the the cold alien wind of sanity blowing down my neck, and (laughs) it was so strange to me, and naturally, I was terrified to tell him that it would take more than one hand to count the classes I almost failed because I had fallen in love again, and... I mean, I don't want to give you the wrong impression. It's not like I fell in love all the time. I usually waited till the weekend or (laughs) maybe Friday if she knew her Bible really well. It was hard to find people like that at Berkeley. But um, all too often, I was the willing victim of my own flesh, you know, down in my own nexus, right? That that nerve cluster, my, my own confused, very powerful emotions. I knew God in those years. I loved him, I would say desperately. Uh, I don't know if that's ever changed, actually. But I was still a conflicted and uh, 
and I would say lost person in my inner being. God was, was recasting me, and there were plenty of times when I didn't know what was driving me. So here's an antithesis. Uh, something like my cosmic opposite was Jonathan Edwards as a young man. I don't know how much you know about Edwards. Edwards started at Yale when he was, anybody know this? He was 12 years old. To start at Yale in the early 1700s, you had to show up knowing Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. That was just to get in. So he's 12 years old. He knows Latin, Greek, and Hebrew. Uh, he graduates. That's not even the amazing thing. He graduates four years later. <laughs> he's 16 years old, and he's valedictorian of his class. Yeah, that was totally me at Cal. I was just that same way, yeah, <laughs> except for those 35 girls I dated. So um, it, Edwards was this eminently sane and level-headed I mean, kid, young man, middle-aged man. But here's the beautiful thing I think about Edwards. He was just a wildly passionate man. I want to give you one example from his journals that speaks to uh, Edwards' own inner self. And um, I'm still an emotional person. I'm not going to get through this, but I'm going to give it my best shot. Uh, Edwards writes, I have sometimes had a sense of the excellent fullness of Christ and his meetness and suitableness as a savior, whereby he has appeared to me far above all the chief of 10,000. And then I'm, I'm abbreviating a little bit. He, he says he's often filled with uh, inward strugglings and groanings. He's thinking Romans 8, that cannot be uttered, to be emptied of myself and to be swallowed up in Christ. And then he gives this one story. Once as I rode out into the woods for my health in the year 1737, and having lit from my horse in a retired place, some quiet glade in the woods, I had a view that for me was extraordinary, of the glory of the Son of God as mediator between God and man, and his wonderful and great and full and pure and sweet grace and love and his meek and gentle condescension. This grace that appeared to me so calm and sweet appeared great above the heavens. The person of Christ appeared ineffably excellent to me, I love that phrase, with an excellency great enough to swallow up all thought and conception. This continued as near as I could tell for about an hour which kept me the greater part of the time in a flood of tears and weeping aloud. I felt an ardency of soul to be, I know not otherwise how to express it, emptied and annihilated, to lie in the dust and to be full of Christ alone, to love him with a holy and pure love, to trust in him, to live upon him, to serve and follow him, and to be totally wrapped up in the fullness of Christ. So here's full disclosure, I lied to you at the beginning of the sermon. I said much of Paul's prayer is difficult to understand. I don't really think that's true. Well, it's kind of true. But I said it mostly just to set up this quote. All those terms that seem so vague, I think they're all here. Isn't Edwards explaining what it is to be filled with all the fullness of God? Doesn't this work as a definition of the riches of his glory? Isn't this a man who's being strengthened in that hour in his inner being? Uh, and wasn't, wasn't that hour, like the benediction at the end, beyond all that he might ask or imagine? You know, I, when, I, when I heard of uh, uh, your librarian's death, uh, I thought, that's a significant change. I wonder if uh, I should change this message. And so uh, in that moment, I prayed. And, you know, that, that man, I, I don't know. I, I actually saw him last night. I came to print this in the library. That man is in the presence of Christ. He, he's in the fullness of God. He's been enveloped in the fullness of God. Uh, I mean, technically for us in our theology, he's in the intermediate state. But, you know, Jesus says to the thief on the cross, today you'll be, 
with me in paradise. And we often think, well, the operative term there is paradise, but actually the operative term there is with me. You'll be with me today in paradise. And he's, he's with his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Lucky man. Uh, blessed, blessed man. Pray for that family. Nobody my age can resist giving advice to people your age. I'll, I'll be brief. <laughs> Go to the end of Ephesians 3. Take this and turn it into four or five petitions for yourself. Would you do that? Pray it for yourself. Pray it for your friends. Pray it for your family. All of us need to be recast in our innermost selves. There are times, uh, I, I got out of school, I don't know, 35 years ago, something. I, there are times when I think how I'm vastly different from that kid who graduated from college. But at other times, I feel like I'm still almost exactly that same person. I'm still praying that God would recast me in my innermost self. Pray that. For, use these petitions and pray it for yourself. And what I'd like to do now is pray it, I'll, I'll pray it for all of you, faculty included. Why don't we stand, and I'll say a benediction when we're done, but uh, let's stand and let me pray for you. Please join me in prayer. We come to you, Lord, as a father who loves and gives gifts to his children. For each of us here, faculty, guests included, we ask that through the riches of your glory, you would strengthen us in our inmost selves, that Christ would dwell in us, and that we would be rooted and grounded in his love, that we would understand fully the love of Christ for ourselves. We need this. The love of Christ for the world, just as Paul cares so much about his own world and Gentiles who... Uh, just a few years before he would have said were people radically different than himself. Uh, but here his heart is poured out for them, Father. We, we pray that you would fill us with your own fullness. We pray that somewhere, sometime, you would give us also our own hour in the woods. We know, we believe you can do exceedingly, abundantly, more than all we ask or imagine. So we come, Lord, in confidence praying that your glory would be exalted above all the earth. We love you, Lord. We long to love you more. We pray that you would work that in us, recast us in our innermost selves. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.